Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. In this part of the test, you'll hear Dr. Jean Matthews interviewing Michael Fraser, a patient with a recent problem. Good morning, Michael. Um, come on in and take a seat. Um, my name is Jean Matthews. Well, hello, Doctor. Well, uh, can you tell me what's brought you here today? Well, to be honest, I haven't been feeling well for the past week or so. That's no good. What sort of symptoms have you had? I've had a fever for a few days. It uh, comes on worse in the afternoons as well. Mm -hmm. I have been feeling a bit nauseous as well. And are you taking anything for that? Uh, Panadol, things like that? No, I haven't. I've just been trying to tough it out. Okay. And what about your eating habits? Um, have you noticed any change to your appetite? Yeah, well, I don't seem to be as hungry. I haven't been able to complete my meals without feeling a bit sick. Mm. And uh, with the nausea, has it ended up in vomiting? Yeah, I did vomit actually, both yesterday morning and this morning. That's one of the reasons I thought I'd better come and see you. Okay. And what about any other aches or pains generally? I'm feeling a bit, little bit tired and I've had a few pains in my joints and uh, I've been a little bit stiff in the mornings. Mm -hmm. And have you noticed any, any other sort of changes, um, such as yellowish skin or in the whites of your eyes? Well, I didn't, but my wife commented this morning that uh, mm. she thought um, my skin had turned a bit yellowish. Mm. And what about the colour of your urine? Um, any changes there? Well, now you mention it, I, I do think it's become darker in colour. Mm. Okay, I see. Now, Michael, I'd just like to get some background details before we go any further. Um, could we start, just start with your age, please? I'm 38. Are you married? Yes, I am. And any children? Yeah, I've got two children. And how old are they? I've got a daughter who's nine and a son who's eleven. Oh, lovely. Okay. And what about your employment? Um, what sort of work do you do? I'm a carpenter by trade. I see. And uh, you work mainly on building sites and places like that? Well, I do work on building sites, but the company I'm currently working for now has quite a few overseas projects, so I do go overseas quite a bit with my work. Mm. And whereabouts have you worked recently? Well, this year I've been to East Timor and I've just come back from New Guinea about uh, 10 days ago. Mm, I see. Okay. And uh, just tell me a little bit more about your general health. Well, pretty fine, I think. I eat healthily and I haven't had any complaints. And uh, do you smoke at all? I do smoke, but I try to keep it under control. I suppose I smoke about 10 cigarettes a day. Mm, okay. And uh, what about alcohol? Well, I have a couple of beers most days, but my wife and I are trying to be responsible and have a couple of alcohol three days each week. Mm, well, that's an excellent idea. Okay. Very good. And now, just to go on to your family history, um, what about your parents? Are they in good health? Yeah, they're both in quite good health. Um, my father... He retired a couple of years ago, but he's fine. And my mother, she's well, she does have high blood pressure and she does take some medication for that, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got three sisters and they're all well. Okay, good. Well, Michael, your blood pressure is certainly excellent and um, you're not overweight. I'm pleased to hear that. Mm, but what I do think, based on your symptoms um, and the jaundice and everything you've told me, I'm a, a little concerned that you might have hepatitis A. Really? 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is not something to be greatly alarmed about, but it may be connected with your overseas travel. It's spread through fecal oral transmission, and it may be that you've, you've touched something or, and that's been contaminated, for example. So you think I might have picked this up on one of my overseas trips then? Mm, so yes, it's very possible. Um, when you travel, do you eat the local foods? Well, actually, because I do travel a lot, I am aware of the risks and I'm very careful with what I eat. I try to only eat food from the hotel and on this particular trip I didn't eat out in the marketplace mm -hmm. and I always drank bottled water. Okay. Well, look, I'm sure you did take proper precautions, but um, even when we do this, it's still quite possible, you know, sometimes um, the hotel staff may not have practiced the, the level of hygiene required. Um, they might have touched utensils or food that you've eaten, and that's how this can be picked up. So, oh, I see. Well, this is a real nuisance for me, Doctor. If I've got this hepatitis, what can I expect to happen now? Well, uh, the first thing we need to do is confirm this diagnosis, and for that you'll need to take a liver function test. I see. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a vascular surgeon talking to a new patient called Monica Patterson. The questions 13 to 24 complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mrs. Patterson. Your GP has sent you to see me because of some problems with your legs, is that right? Yes, varicose veins, and they've just been getting worse and worse. Right. Well, I've got some notes here from your GP, but I wonder if you could tell me in your own words when this started and what's happened so far. Well, I guess the first time I had problems with my legs was ages ago, when I was pregnant. My son's 25 now, so that shows you how long ago it was. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone knows that varicose veins goes with that, don't they? They look horrible at the time, but then they usually disappear again. And was that the case? Well, by about a year or 18 months later, they'd gone completely. My legs were looking and feeling fine, and I was back at work then too. Uh-huh. What do you do? I was a chef in quite a busy restaurant, so there wasn't much opportunity for sitting around in that job, Doctor, I can tell you. <laughs> but then, oh, um, it must be getting on for four years ago now, I noticed the veins were coming back. At first, I wasn't too concerned, although they seemed to get very scaly, and they itched too around the calves. I tried to follow the advice you find on websites, you know, move around at work, try to keep your feet up on a stool and avoid crossing your legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did insist on getting a bit of exercise every day. I always managed to fit in walking around town after the lunch service, just for about half an hour or so. Mm, good. Uh, and what treatments have you had so far, Mrs Patterson? I first went to see my GP just because they looked ghastly and I was a bit worried about them. But he said that he could only recommend proper treatment when they got worse and were painful or I had any complications. But um, he did tell me I should lose some weight. <laughs> That's an occupational hazard in my job. Good advice, though. Well, I did manage to get it down a bit. <laughs> 
Anyway, about a year ago, my left leg really swelled up. In fact, they both look pretty nasty with the bulging veins. And you, you can see now mm -hmm. my feet and ankles are really swollen up. Yeah. Also, when I'm in bed, I regularly wake up with terrible cramps. Last night, I didn't know where to put myself. So um, then the doctor did an ultrasound scan to see if there was a blood clot. Uh, thankfully, that was all clear. But we agreed it was time to get my legs sorted. Yeah. Um, the doctor arranged for me to have some injections of foam in the veins he said it was quite a new treatment. Mm. It was just with a local anaesthetic and I didn't have to stay in overnight, which was good. Uh, I had to wear bandages afterwards for a week or so. And then those um, uh, compression stockings yeah. for another week. And since then? Well, that seemed to do the trick at first. They felt much better to start with. Although I had awful headaches for the first few days, which I gather happens sometimes. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, now they really seem to be worse than ever. So I'm back to square one. Uh. I'm thinking that either we have another go with the injections or maybe I need to consider surgery this time. Uh, that's obviously more invasive, and I know from other people that I'd be very sore afterwards and would have to take time off work. Uh, that's a consideration too. I run my own hotel now, so I can't just close it for weeks on end, can I? Mm. So uh, what do you suggest now, Doctor? This is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which best fits according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about different types of kidney cancer cells. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of kidney cancer cells? Well, there are about 10 different types of kidney cancer cells. Clear cell is very common type of cell found in about 70% of kidney cancers, which may be slow growing or grade 1 and less aggressive, or may be grade 4 with a very aggressive growth. Clear cells are susceptible to treatment with immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Papillary cancer cells is seen in 10% to 15% of patients and has further subtypes called type 1 and type 2. Sarcomatoid cells grow most aggressively of all types of kidney cancer cells. It may be found with clear cell or papillary type. The cancer cells appear like sarcoma cells under the microscope. Collecting duct cancer is similar to transitional cell carcinoma and is rare and is usually treated with chemotherapy. Oncocytoma is a slow-growing cancer and does not spread beyond the kidneys. Chromophobe is another type of rare cancer. Angiomyolipoma is a non-cancerous tumor that has a unique appearance on the computed tomography scan. This type of cancer is less likely to grow aggressively and spread and is treated surgically.
Question 26. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about fibrosis. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is fibrosis, and what are the different types of fibrosis? Well, the term fibrosis means the formation of fibrous tissue that may or may not be connected with tissue healing. Some of the different types of fibrosis are lung fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis may occur as a result of prolonged infections, such as tuberculosis or pneumonia. The condition is also caused by exposure to occupational hazards such as coal dust or the genetic condition called cystic fibrosis. Liver fibrosis or cirrhosis refers to the scar tissue and nodules that replace liver tissue and disrupt liver function. The condition is usually caused due to alcoholism, fatty liver disease, and hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Heart fibrosis affects the regions of the heart that have become damaged due to myocardial infarction may undergo fibrosis. Mediastinal fibrosis is characterized by calcified fibrosis of the lymph nodes that can block respiratory channels and blood vessels. Retroperitoneal cavity fibrosis affects the soft tissue in the retroperitoneum, which contains the aorta, kidneys, and numerous other structures. Bone marrow fibrosis, or myelofibrosis, is scarring in the bone marrow that prevents the normal production of blood cells in the bone marrow. Skin fibrosis is the scar tissue that forms on the skin in response to injury, called a keloid. Scleroderma, or cystic sclerosis, is an autoimmune disease of the connective tissue that initially affects the skin but also involves other organs such as the kidneys, heart, and lungs. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about autophagy. Now read the question. Doctor, what is an autophagy, and what are the types? Well, autophagy is a process which includes the consumption of the body's own tissue during a metabolic process that occurs due to starvation and in certain diseases. The different types of autophagy are Macroautophagy processes involves delivery of cytoplasmic cargo to the lysosome through the intermediary of a double membrane bound vesicle, which is called an autophagosome, that fuses with the lysosome to form an autolysosome. Microautophagy. During this process, the cytosolic components are directly consumed by the lysosome itself through the lysosomal membrane. Chaperone-mediated autophagy. During this process, the targeted proteins are translocated across the lysosomal membrane in a complex with chaperone proteins. Question 28. You hear a discussion about the role of epinephrine in human body. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is the role of epinephrine in our body? Well, triggering fight or flight response is the role of epinephrine in our body. This occurs when a person is subject to a threat, which causes a signaling process to occur, leading to our reaction to the potential danger. Epinephrine and liver cells. One of the places where epinephrine has an effect is in the liver. Epinephrine, along with another hormone called glucagon, is responsible for the breakdown of glycogen in liver cells. Epinephrine and the lungs. The lungs contain smooth muscle, 
Epinephrine causes smooth muscles to relax. Specifically, epinephrine binds to beta-2 adrenergic receptors on bronchial muscle cells. Epinephrine and the skin. The effect of epinephrine on the skin is mainly caused by it binding to alpha adrenergic receptors, the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor in particular. Epinephrine and the heart. Epinephrine binds to beta-adrenergic receptors on heart muscle cells. This causes the contraction rate of the heart to increase. This ultimately leads to increased blood supply to the tissues in the body. Question 29. You hear a lecture about ringworm diseases. Now read the question. Ringworm, or tinea, or dermatophytosis, is a common skin and nail infection caused by fungus. Because the disease causes an itchy, red, circular rash, the disease is called ringworm. The different types of ringworm are usually named for the location of the infection in the body. Areas of the body parts that can be affected by ringworm are tinea pedis infects the feet, which is also called athlete's foot. Tinea cruris infects inner thighs, groin, or buttocks, which is also called jock itch. Tinea capitis infects the scalp, and tinea barbe infects the beard. Tinea manuum cause infections in hands. Tinea unguium or onychomycosis, infects fingernails and toenails or fingernails. Tinea corporis infects other body parts, such as legs and arms. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are different types of humanoid arthritis? Knowing the exact type of rheumatoid arthritis will be very helpful to provide an appropriate treatment to the patient. Types of rheumatoid arthritis include if a patient has seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, the blood test result would show a positive rheumatoid factor. This means the patient has the antibodies that cause the immune system to attack the joints. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis refers to rheumatoid arthritis in people younger than 17 years of age. The condition was previously known as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The symptoms are the same as those of other types of rheumatoid arthritis, however, they may also include eye inflammation and issues with physical development. If the patient has a seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, the blood test would show a negative rheumatoid factor and a negative anticyclic citrullinated peptide. But if the patient still has rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, it may be probably a seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. The patient may eventually develop antibodies, changing the diagnosis to seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. Now look at extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear an ear, nose and throat specialist called Cynthia Davison giving a presentation about the causes and treatment of nosebleeds. 
You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Good afternoon, I'm Cynthia Davison, and my presentation will focus on the causes and treatments of nosebleeds and the implications for those of us working in the health service. About 60% of people get nosebleeds at some time in their life, particularly children and old people. Most of these events resolve spontaneously, and the mortality rate from nosebleeds is extremely low. But treating them still costs the health service a lot of money. In my own hospital, over 40% of admissions in ENT involve nosebleeds. Ideally, we treat many of these as outpatients, yet the majority of those patients will stay in for five days. Last year, in my department, a quarter of a million euros was spent on the management of this condition. Clearly, any saving on that, if duplicated in hospitals across the country, would have a positive impact on resources for other services. The biggest enemy of the nosebleed is artificial air. In hospitals, we get an awful lot of older people coming in with nosebleeds in winter months. As you'll know, such patients don't tolerate the cold for various reasons, so they tend to sit beside radiators and heaters, and these dry up the air. This means the cilia, which protect the lining of the nose, dry out, and this in turn exposes the blood vessels, which causes bleeding. Our noses haven't developed a defense mechanism against artificial air. 300 years ago, everybody lived in drafty houses and cold environments. Now we all sit in heated rooms, and the nose hasn't adapted to this. The evolution of an organ can take millions of years, in fact. The immediate cause of a nosebleed can be local trauma or inflammation caused by a simple cold, but systemic diseases have to be ruled out in all adults presenting with the condition. People with chronic allergies in the nose are more prone to nosebleeds, and there are some other serious conditions that can present in this way, including cases where the kidney or the liver is no longer functioning as it should. Foreign bodies that enter the nose by some means can trigger nosebleeds, though these are more common in children than adults, and usually there'd be a foul discharge associated with the foreign body. But for a lot of the nosebleeds we see, about 30%, we can't find a specific cause. A lot of people who are at the age where they get high blood pressure are prone to nosebleeds, but the blood pressure itself doesn't cause them. So when we see an adult with a nosebleed, we have to consider the systemic cause, not just look at the event itself. Now there's a pathway of care associated with nosebleeds. First of all, it's advisable to check whether or not a patient's in shock. A loss of at least 500 mils of blood is needed to get the early signs of shock and it's rare to lose that amount during a common nosebleed. But if you ask any of my colleagues in ENT what they most hate dealing with, it's nosebleeds. This is because they tend to come in late at night, 
The patient's often scared, and that sets their blood pressure off, making any further diagnosis and treatment problematic. So before you can do anything, you have to allay their fears. You might even give them a sedative to try to relax them. You also need to check they're not on any medication, like aspirin or warfarin, that might affect blood clotting. The next step is to try to find the precise source of the bleeding. The simplest way to stop it is to apply a silver nitrate stick to that point. It's fairly atraumatic, but you can't get those chemical sticks to the back part of the nose, so they're mainly useful for children who tend to have fewer bleeds from that area than older people. Unfortunately, what often happens when an older patient goes into an emergency department and there may be no ENT service available, as many such departments don't have them, what often happens is that because there's so much blood pouring out, the bleeding point can't be located. In this case, a gauze pack will be put into the nose, both in front and behind the nose, to try to put pressure on the whole area and stop the bleeding that way. This can be very traumatic for the patient, and there's also a danger of secondary infection if it's left in too long. So the ideal management is to identify the bleeding point and stop the bleeding directly by cauterizing it or by ligation of the vessel. And this primary treatment will work 94% of cases. So before I go on to... Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the doctor giving a lecture on different types of viruses and their impacts. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Pox viruses are the oval-shaped or brick-shaped viruses having large double-stranded DNA genomes which exist worldwide, causing disease in humans and many other species. Typically, pox virus infections form lesions, disseminated rash, or skin nodules. In human beings, infection usually occurs due to the contact with infected animals, materials, or individuals. While certain types of pox viruses, such as variola virus or smallpox, no longer exist in nature, other pox viruses still exist and cause diseases to humans. These include ORF virus, monkey pox virus, molluscum contagiosum, etc. The genus Orthopox virus has a number of virus species that can infect humans and animals. The most renowned member of the genus Orthopox virus group is the variola virus, the causative vector of smallpox. Other popular members include the vaccinia virus that is used in the current smallpox vaccine, 
the cowpox virus that was introduced by Edward Jenner as the material of the first vaccine, and the monkeypox virus. Parapox viruses infect a variety of livestock animals, including goats, cattle, and sheep. Generally, human infection of parapox viruses is associated with an occupation involving cattle, goats, and sheep. Some of the renowned parapox viruses are bovine papular stomatitis virus, ORF virus, pseudocalpox virus, parapox virus of red deer, squirrel parapox virus. Molluscum contagiosum is the only member of the molluscipox virus genus. Molluscum contagiosum infects only human beings, and it is a common infection of children and immunodeficient patients. Yatta pox viruses infect both primates and humans across equatorial Africa. Species in this genus are named by the location where they were identified, Yaba of Lagos, Nigeria, and the Tana River Basin of Kenya. However, the natural host of Yatta pox viruses is unknown. Tana pox and Yaba monkey tumor virus are of Yatta pox virus genus. Capri pox viruses cause infection in goats, cattle, and sheep that can cause high morbidity and outbreaks of caprypox viruses that can have a severe economic impact on farmers. The viruses of this genus are listed by the World Organizations for Animal Health as significant animal diseases that require serious concern. Sheeppox virus, goatpox virus, and lumpy skin disease viruses are of caprypox virus genus. The swinepox virus is the only member of the sweepox virus genus, and swine are the only host for this virus. Members of the leprypox genus cause infections to squirrels, hares, and rabbits. In Australia, myxomavirus was used as a pest control in 1950 to eradicate feral European rabbits. Primarily, the transmission of leprypox virus occurs through mosquitoes, although other biting insects such as fleas can also transmit leprypox virus. The myxomavirus, virus, squirrel fibromavirus, hair fibromavirus are of leprypox virus genus. Avipox viruses cause infections to a number of wild and domestic birds that can be identified as causing disease in at least 232 species. Usually, the transmission occurs by inhalation, skin abrasions, or by biting insects like mosquitoes.